Looking back throughout history can really give a person some trust issues. We often learn about the person when we're children, and then as we get older, we discover the rotten truth about them. The monster in our lesson today wasn't familiar to me, but if you grew up in the UK, he is probably a familiar face. His name was Jimmy Seville, and he was a television personality and DJ, and also known for his charitable contributions during his lifetime. Sadly, we now know that he was also a predator who preyed on children. Let's take a closer look and learn why you should never leave your children alone with anyone you don't know, especially one who has the power and influence to hide their misdeeds. Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the most rotten one of all? Hi, hello, and howdy, my darlings. Thank you for joining me on this lesson of Rotten to the Core. I am your not-so-evil queen, Joshua Waters, and welcome to my lair. This is the history podcast about rotten people, where we attempt to learn a lesson or two from them and their rotten lives. I am finally over my case of the COVID, and aside from a little COVID brain, I'm feeling ship shape. I hope everyone is doing well. It seems that sickness in multiple forms is spreading like wildfire. Don't forget to wash your hands thoroughly and cover your coughs and sneezes with your elbow. January is depressing enough with out the added strain of illness. And sadly, our lesson today won't help any. It's yet another lesson about how someone was adored by millions and turned out to be a rotten turd of a person named Jimmy Seville. For Jimmy, it wasn't until after his death that allegations were taken seriously although it's believed that they were known about and covered up while he was alive. Jimmy was born the youngest of seven children on Halloween in 1926 in Leeds, West Riding, Yorkshire, to a Roman Catholic family. His father was the breadwinner and worked as a bookmaker's clerk and sold insurance, while Jimmy's mother was a homemaker. Some would say the toughest job. Jimmy would often speak about how poor his family was. After all, it was during the Great Depression, and his father didn't make a lot of money to help support the family. He described his father as scrupulously honest and scrupulously broke. Jimmy only stayed in school until the age of 14 when he left to work in an office to try to help support his family. A lot of kids. When he was 18 during World War II, He went to work in the coal mines until he injured his spine in a blasting accident. The injury would cause him to take a while off of work. In the whole three years he recovered, he had to wear a steel corset and use walking sticks to get around. I wasn't able to find a lot that was negative about his childhood, aside from a case of pneumonia when he was around two years old. His family was in poverty, but as a child of poverty myself, I don't necessarily see that as a weakness. A lack of money doesn't always mean a lack of happiness. When Jimmy recovered from his spinal injury, he worked briefly as a scrap metal dealer. Eventually, Jimmy got the opportunity to work as a DJ in a dance hall. He would say later that he was the first DJ. He then became a semi-professional sportsman, competing in the 1951 Tour of Britain cycle race. And then he worked as a professional wrestler. It took Jim a few trial and errors until he found his niche. Hell, I've been a hairdresser, a doll groomer, cake decorator, caterer, CNA, cashier, and an activities director. 
before I was given the opportunity to start podcasting. Nothing wrong with trying a few things on for size. By 1968, Jimmy was working as a radio DJ at Radio Luxembourg and reached an audience of up to 6 million people. From there, he was able to turn his radio gigs into a lucrative television career. That led to a show called Jim Will Fix It and ran from 1975 until 1994. In the show, children were encouraged to write in their wishes. The ones who were chosen would have their wishes granted on the show and receive a medal that said, Jim fixed it. He even won an award in 1977 for his wholesome family content. In 2000, Jim was the subject of a documentary called When Lewis Met, which Lewis Throw hosted. In the documentary, Jimmy confided that he used to beat up people and lock them in a basement during his career as a nightclub manager. Then Lewis challenged Jimmy about rumors of pedophilia from a decade before, to which Jimmy said, We live in a very funny world, and it's easier for me as a single man to say I don't like children, because that puts a lot of salacious tabloids off the hunt. Jimmy wasn't only known for his radio and television work, though. During his lifetime, he helped raise an estimated 40 million pounds for various charities. Some of them were hospitals specifically for children and teenagers. And Jimmy eventually had full and unlimited access to them as a volunteer, something that would eventually be questioned later as to why any volunteer had that amount of access to patients. From 1974 to 1988, Seville was the honorary president of Physically Handicapped in the Able-Bodied Community. He sponsored medical students performing undergraduate research at Leeds University Research Enterprise, where he donated more than £60,000 annually. He set up two charities, the Jimmy Seville Stroke Mandeville Hospital Trust in 1981 and the Leeds-based Jimmy Seville Charitable Trust in 1984. During the sexual abuse scandal in October of 2012, the charities announced that they would distribute their funds of £1.7 million and £3.7 million, pounds, respectively, among other charities, and then they would close down. Jimmy was even the recipient of numerous honors. He notably was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire in 1971 and was knighted in 1990 in recognition for his charity work. His other awards included a knighthood in 1982 from the Vatican. He had friends in high places as well, more notably former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and several members of the royal family like now King Charles and the late great Diana, Princess of Wales. Jimmy acted as an unofficial advisor to then Prince Charles, who sought his advice on a number of occasions and how the royal family ought to interact with the public and the media. Jimmy was a bachelor his entire life as well, and lived with his mother, whom he called Duchess. When she passed, he kept her room and clothing exactly how she left it, and even had her clothes dry-cleaned once a year. In his autobiography, he claimed that he had many sexual relations with women, and that there have been trains and, with apologies to the hit parade, boats and planes and bushes and fields, corridors, doorways, floors, chairs, slag heaps, desks, and probably everything except the celebrated chandelier and ironing board. Little did most people know, some of the people Jimmy was having sexual relations would be underage boys and girls. Jimmy Seville had a long and lucrative career, and he helped a lot of people during it, more notably through charity work. On October 29, 2011, just two days before his 85th birthday, Jimmy was found dead inside of his home after he had been hospitalized with pneumonia only days before. From the outside, Jimmy Seville was a great man who used his life to help those less fortunate. Unfortunately, that was all a mask. 
Aside from his well-crafted public image, it was revealed that during his life, Jimmy was also a predator. In 2012, a year after his death, the British television channel ITV aired a documentary which detailed allegations that Seville had molested or sexually assaulted numerous underage boys and girls. Various investigations were launched as hundreds of possible victims came forward, and the results were pretty damning. Notably, the Crown Prosecution Service and the Metropolitan Police Service released a joint report in 2013 which stated that Jimmy Seville had been a prolific abuser, sexually assaulting up to 500 people. The crimes were primarily committed on BBC premises and at more than 10 hospitals. There were allegations during his lifetime, but they were all squashed by higher-ups to protect their investment in Jimmy. Once he had passed away, the number of accusations was just too much to ignore any longer. A large part of his career and public life were spent working with children and young people, including visiting schools and hospital wards. He spent 20 years from 1964 presenting Top of the Pops, aimed at a teenage audience, and an overlapping 20 years on Jim Will Fix It. While he was alive, two different police investigations considered reports about Jimmy, the earliest known being in 1958, but none of them led to charges. Both reports concluded that there was insufficient evidence. Most of his victims were, as I said, underage girls, and some are said to have been as young as eight years old, with the majority of them being between 12 and 15. Former Sex Pistols vocalist John Lydon alluded to sordid conduct committed by Seville as well as suppression of widely held knowledge about such activities. In October 1978, he interviewed with BBC Radio One, in which John stated, I'd like to kill Jimmy Seville. I think he's a hypocrite. I bet he's into all kinds of seediness that we know about but are not allowed to talk about. I know some rumors, and I bet none of this will be allowed out. As predicted, the comment was edited out by BBC prior to broadcasting. In October 2014, John Lydon expanded on his original quote, saying, by killed, I meant locking him up and stopping him assaulting young children. I'm disgusted at the media, pretending they weren't aware. In 1987, Scottish stand-up comedian Jerry Sadowitz recorded a performance in Edinburgh in which he stated that Seville was a pedophile. The album Gobshite was later withdrawn amid fears of legal action. In a 2009 interview with his biographer, Jimmy defended viewers of child pornography, including pop stars and convicted sex offender Gary Glitter. He argued that viewers didn't do anything wrong, but they are then demonized, and described Glitter as a celebrity being unfairly vilified for watching dodgy films in the privacy of his own home. He went on to say, Gary has not tried to sell them, not tried to show them in public or anything like that, it was for his own gratification. Whether it was right or wrong is, of course, it's up to him as a person. The interview was not published at the time, and the recording was not released until after Jimmy's death. Multiple investigations have looked into all of the allegations, and the evidence and in interviews of his victims are exceedingly bad. Most of them were, as I mentioned, teenage girls who felt helpless and afraid after what Jimmy had done to them. They all claim that Jimmy, who is a very large man, he worked in the coal mines for Christ's sakes, took advantage of them in his offices at BBC or various hotels or hospitals. Some of the attacks even happened in public, while numerous onlookers surrounded them. Several of the victims even said that they received sexually transmitted infections after their attack by Jimmy Seville. I listened to a lot of interviews by his victims, and they were all pretty similar. The young girl would have an opportunity to meet Jimmy, whom they trusted because he was on TV and 
known to help children. They all state that the attacks would happen very quickly, either while they were held up against a wall or sitting on his lap. But multiple girls stated that they would agree to what he called cuddling with Uncle Jimmy before he forced himself into them. Afterwards, he left the girls afraid to even tell their own parents because of the stigma and backlash they would receive for being alone with a full-grown man, as if it was their fault. To any victim of sexual assault who was made out to be a villain, I am sorry for what you had to endure in the aftermath when you just wanted help and justice for what you went through. Too many powerful men have taken what they wanted from the most vulnerable of humanity and faced zero punishment for their actions. I am glad that as time has passed, that is becoming less frequent, and the true villains are getting what's coming to them. Many of his victims remain nameless, even going by fake identities and having their images altered when interviewed. They all deserved better and I only hope that they were somehow able to forge a good life from the trauma that they had to endure. Young girls weren't the only ones who Jimmy Seville preyed upon. One of his victims spoke up in an interview, and in it he says that he was part of an underground, underage sex racket before he was 16 and had aged out of it. He said that his own parents basically pimped him out to different men most of whom he didn't know. In the interview, the victim said that he would often be picked up after school and taken to different places to be abused. At one of the attacks, he claims that he instantly recognized the attacker as Jimmy Seville. That poor, now man, who remains anonymous to protect himself, recalled watching Jimmy on the television helping children by granting their wishes and was now being abused by him. I can only imagine what that would do to the psyche of a young child. Yes, the majority of accusations came after Jimmy's death when the victims could finally feel safe from retribution by coming forward. You have to remember, all of these victims didn't know that Jimmy was doing this to other people. They felt too afraid and too alone to come forward, probably thinking, that they would just be ignored. In my own past, men have abused me sexually, mentally, and emotionally. And the most recent man died only a few years ago. It wasn't me, I promise. And it wasn't until I physically read his obituary that I felt safe again. I literally played because Earl had to die by the chicks on repeat that same day. I had finally felt free from the grasp he still had on me years later. And we also don't get to decide when someone speaks out about their abuse. We can only help them heal when they finally do. On October 9, 2012, relatives of Jimmy said that the headstone at his grave would be removed, destroyed, and sent to a landfill. The Seville family expressed their sorrow for the anguish of the victims and respect for public opinion. His body is entered in a cemetery in Scarborough, although it has been proposed that it be exhumed and cremated. In 2012, Richard Harrison, a long-serving psychiatric nurse at Broadmoor Hospital, said that Jimmy Seville had been regarded by staff as a man with a severe personality disorder and a liking for children. Another nurse, Bob Allen, considered Jimmy Seville to be a psychopath, stating, A lot of the staff said he should be behind bars. He also stated that he had once reported Jimmy to his supervisors for apparent improper conduct with a juvenile, but there was no action taken. Even psychologists in The Guardian and The Herald argued that Seville exhibited the dark triad of personality traits. Narcissism, Machiavellianism and psychopathy. That's not the first rotten person we've covered that's had those same traits. That's how I knew how to pronounce Machiavellianism. 
During the independent inquiry into sexual abuse in March 2019, it was reported that Robert Armstrong, the head of the Honors Committee, had resisted attempts by Margaret Thatcher to award Sevilla knighthood in the 1980s due to concerns about his private life. An anonymous letter received by the committee in 1998 said that reports of a pedophilia nature could emerge about Jimmy Seville. In June of 2014, UK Secretary of State for Health Jeremy Hunt delivered a public apology in the House of Commons to the patients of the National Health Service for their abuse. He said Seville was a callous, opportunistic, wicked predator who abused and assaulted individuals. Many of them patients and young people who expected and had a right to expect to be safe. His actions spanned five decades, from the 1960s to 2010. As a nation at that time, we held Seville in our affection as a somewhat eccentric national treasure with a strong commitment to charitable causes. Today's report shows that in reality, he was a sickening and prolific sexual abuser who repeatedly exploited the trust of a nation for his own vile purposes. In 2022, former BBC presenter Mark Lawson wrote about his encounters with Jimmy Seville and heard from many BBC personnel about his abuse and even rumored necrophilia. Lawson ended by saying, The true story of his victims and how the BBC, Department of Health, the Conservative Party, Catholic Church, police forces, local councils, and libel law had let them down. A monster for whom the British establishment, political royal broadcasting, medical, charitable, providing a dazzling shield. To all the victims of Jimmy Seville, I commend you for your bravery and resilience. I am truly sorry for what you had to go through, and I send you all as much loving light of healing that you can handle. Perhaps one day, the world will be a safe place for everyone, especially children. But until that day comes, I will stand up for and fight alongside every victim of human predators. The lesson I learned from Jimmy Seville is that children are the most precious of us, and they deserve to be protected at all cost from having to endure such rotten, vile things from happening to them. Every single child born on this earth deserves to have a childhood of happiness and love. My hope is that everyone who dares to prey upon one of them will endure the most brutal of karmic retribution, either in this lifetime or the next. There are just some crimes in which there's no forgiveness to be had. I appreciate and thank each and every one of you for helping to support Rotten to the Core. Until next week, be happy, find peace, and don't hurt anyone. If you enjoy Rotten to the Core, please follow me on Instagram or join me on Patreon. Both of those are at It's Rotten to the Core. I also have a TikTok now at Rotten in History. And you can also listen to me on my other podcast, Mystery Inc., that I do with my older brother, Shane. And we have a Facebook group called Shane and Josh's Rabbit Hole, where we have a plethora of extra fun, foul, mysterious, rotten, and historical things all a brewing. Join us there and have a great week ahead, everyone. Bye.